The following podcast is sponsored by Words and Pictures Comics, located at 2610 Center Street, number 6. Words and Pictures is your one-stop shop for vintage back issues and cutting-edge graphic novels. Awesome service, great shop, check them out. Welcome everyone to episode 246 of Just Joshing. I am your host, Joshua Pentelaresco. I write stuff and podcast too. Today, my guest is the one and only Christy Stratos. Christy is an author, a host of her own show. She was fun to talk to. Uh, I was very open, very friendly. Uh, excellent interview in her own right. It was actually really, I'm sure from her perspective, it was nice to actually be on the other end of asking the questions for a bit. Uh, it was a good time. I really, really enjoyed my chat with her. Uh, I'm a little bit more energized today, although this is still a little late. I had to find this episode. It actually hit on me from where it used to be. I had to actually go on my own quest to find it. I found it, which is good. But I'm a little late as a result. Um, next week, we'll be back to normal. Next week, I start my Creative Reds interview. So for the, my 250th episode, which is in two weeks, Mackenzie Carr will be my guest. Mackenzie Carr is the illustrator of my next book, Alice Zero. By that point, by episode 250, there will be a order place where you can order the book, and hopefully uh, sales can begin at that point. I'm really excited about that. Uh, but the Creative Ink starts next week with an old an old guest returning, John Maven. A little bit different episode than what I've never done in the past. Uh, we kind of get overwhelmed, we'll, and I'll talk about that on his episode on Monday. But, uh, yeah, like I said, I'm feeling really good about how things are going right now. So let's just get to our conversation with Christy, shall we? So. <laughs> That's always good. Yes. I'm always. I should. I should warn you two things. One, the recorder's on, so if there's anything really super incriminating, you should make it good. And two, I'm always this. Uh, I'm always as serious when we do interviews. So. Okay. Yeah. Is that are, is that good? <laughs> yeah, we're good to go. We're good to go. You're like, okay, sure, let's do whatever, let's fly. How you doing? <laughs> yeah, I'm doing well. How are you? Yeah. yeah well, I, as I told you, I'm very serious, as you can tell, right? Yeah, I know. You, you you believe me. I can I I can hear the belief in your voice or something to that effect. Anyway, so I have heard lots of good things about you from Mr. Joe Compton. I have heard lots of good things about you from some other people that you've interviewed. So we can go. We, so you are also someone that interviews people, but you also are a very accomplished writer in yourself. So which came first, and how did you stumble into it? Well, um, first I started writing. I've always uh, wanted to be a writer ever since I was a kid, and I've always written ever since I was a kid, uh, ever since I could. So it was definitely the writing part, um, finding the author community on Facebook, that uh, that made a huge difference to me. Uh, I, I really wasn't in any writing community beforehand, so finding that was great, and then of course that expands out to Twitter and Instagram and everywhere else. and. And um, that's how I started seeing that I would love to talk about it as well. And um, I have, of course, The Writer's Edge, which is currently on hiatus. It's on YouTube. And um, that was actually originally Joshua Robertson's. And he handed it off to me, which was a dream because I was looking at it. I had been on it a couple of times. I was looking at it and saying, wow, that's a really great show. I would love to build something like that, but I'm not sure if I'm willing to do it from scratch. And then it just so happened that he wanted to um, hand it off to someone else, and that someone else happened to be me. So <laughs> that's how I got started um, with all of that, and now I'm also on Creative Edge Writers Showcase, which is, um, that is on iTunes and SoundCloud, and it's all over the place, and that's one-on-one -on -one interviews. So they both play into each other all the time. So are you more comfortable with the one-on-one -on -one or the panel stuff? I like both. They're very, very different things. Um, the one-on-one, -on -one I get to really dig in a lot deeper with, with one person, go into their past blog posts, new art, news articles about them, all that kind of stuff, and really discuss, you know, where their writing is coming from and, um, you know, just such interesting things about them and their writing. Whereas with the panels, I really enjoy them for the discussion factor and getting different points of view and seeing how they play off each other. So it's, it's really hard to pick one in particular. 
Well, for me, I, I always particularly find I prefer the one-on-one -on -one myself because I like I like digging deep into people. My because it, I think that's where the good stuff is. Um, panels are fun because of the discussions, but I, I find it's you can't be quite as intimate with them. That all said. Um, it, there's some ways that I find they're a little easier because all you really have to do is ask a question and just get out of the way. Like, l l all I have to do is let them do their thing and I I'm just here to just push it along if need be. That's all I have to do. So, it, um, there's, defi there, there's definitely places where I think panels are, are a lot more fun. Um, but, yeah, I, like, I, like for me, it's, it's always these one-on-one -on -one chats. So... So, are you like me, where you just really fascinated with people's stories in general, or are you, just, or is it just, is it more writer centric, like like the writing, the craft of writing? We do talk about the craft of writing. I like it because I love learning about people, and I like digging into psychology as well, which I only do to not such an extent unless they're open to it. Um, you know, on an. In or something along those lines. But I, I do have a great interest in that. It's in all my books. And uh, I love reading biographies and anything similar, um, especially, like, I personally really like the ones of old movie stars because um, they're already, you know, they've lived their whole lives and we have a lot of perspectives. We have other people's perspectives. We have theirs, their kids, everyone's. And so you can actually piece their story together, what you think is probably true and what you think is probably not true because no matter whose point of view you're hearing it from, there's only so much fact in there. Um, so it's a great analytical way to <clears throat> dig into psychology a bit more. Ah, so did you want to be a psychologist at some point too? I didn't. I thought it would probably be too emotional, but uh, the idea is an interesting one. It's just not something that I ever wanted to pursue because, you know, while I like digging into that stuff, like I said, it just seems um, very emotional. And um, I think that you have to have a certain type of personality to probably be able to do that and not have it affect you. I, I, I think I'm just based on some of the stuff I've done on mine, it's impossible. It will affect you no matter what. Um, mm. it, it's just, you, you, people trust you. And when people trust you, they tell you, they tell you their story. And when they do that, um, I mean, they're sharing. And that's a, and that in itself is a very special thing, you know? Uh, but the, on top of that, um, I mean, some, it, it really depends on what people want to share. And, Sometimes they they'll share really personal stuff with you that will surprise you, and that fact that you're even being included in that. And on the flip side, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's their experience and how they've dealt with these great moments or these terrible moments, and you know, it, it's a fulfill. It's it's an honor, and at the same time, though, it's I mean, it does make you. It does. Um, it cannot help but change you. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it does make total sense. And some people are more sensitive, on the more sensitive side, and that would make it very hard. I, I would be one of those people where I would probably absorb their problems into myself, and um, that's exactly what you don't want. <laughs> no, that's... <laughs> like, uh... <laughs> so I would not be the best candidate there. I'm good at, you know, talking people through their problems and stuff like that, but it's very, very different when you're in that position I, I... of, um, you know, hearing such in-depth issues that they're... <laughs> asking for your help, your advice and, on a professional level, and I just feel that that kind of pressure and the kinds of things that can be revealed are a bit different than what happens socially or in interviews. It's definitely a whole other level, and you, you've got to not be super sensitive, I think. Uh, well, I, 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 think, I think, so I could just see this now, you'd be like, okay, thank you for telling me this, excuse me, I have an appointment, who's mine? I'm going to the couch now. And then you go talk to another psycho psychologist who'd be like, "I don't think this should be your line of work, but I want to help people." It's like, no, I did just, just no, <laughs> yeah, but, which is totally fine. Like you, you, you have to know your limitations too, and that's a very important, uh, that's a very important factor to to whatever it is you choose to do. So you've been writing since you were a little kid. So if that's the case, so what? So do you still have many of your stories as a little kid? And what did you write? I wrote a lot of poetry, a lot of poetry. It could be about anything. 
Um, I actually wrote novels before I wrote short stories, which is kind of funny. Usually you start with the short form, but I didn't really understand how to do short form for a long time, even though you, you know, you grow up reading kids books and they're shorter and I just couldn't really grasp how to tell a story that short and didn't really, I liked the novel form always. So I started with, um, poetry, which I, I don't know how much of that I really read before I started writing it. I'm sure I read it. Um, but I couldn't tell you like what kind of kinds of books or anything. And um, so I started with that. And then in middle school, I wrote my first novel. And that was really um, more of my giving it a shot and being really excited that I could do it. But it was never something even at that point when I was all excited about it that I ever thought I would want to publish or try to get published. It was just, you know, how they say a first draft is you telling yourself the story. Well, this was me saying, I can do this. This is great. And this is something I really, truly enjoyed. Now let me move on when the time is right to a topic I would want to publish. You know, so then I wrote my second novel in high school. And again, it wasn't something publishable because it was amateurish. It's not that the idea was bad it was it was too amateurish and I simply didn't have the the level the maturity the skill to really um, dissect while I could read other writers works and like dissect um, do analyses like we've learned in school and go beyond that a bit it just wasn't to the degree that I could understand how to apply that to my writing yet so um, I never put that out and when I reread it now of course I'm um, um, as a professional editor, I can look at it and say, well, here are all your weak points. You know, I can see how you could fix it. But at the time, it just seemed impossible. I just couldn't understand how to apply what I admired so much in other people's works to what I write, which is now what I do. Yeah, I had a novel I did uh, like in my early 20s. It emulated something because I really loved, I did enjoy the how George R. R. Martin did his Game of Thrones, like how he did it. Uh, little did I know how hard that is to actually do. It doesn't. It if you don't have the um, chops for it, man, that, that's a really hard way to learn how to write. But we all we all look at the stuff we like and we try to emulate it when we get started. And I think, what, especially in the early stages, uh, you're 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 copying more than actually having your voice. And especially because you're younger, and you don't have the experiences to uh to really really add depth to your stories it's when you get old it's it's when you've done but it's like anything else you practice it and eventually you get more comfortable with expressing yourself wherever you are in your life and i think that's that's what translates to the page that's exactly right and i i really feel that the more uncomfortable you are with writing your thoughts and ideas down the harder it is for you to put something down and, and edit it and put it into any kind of form that's um, publishable or that you'd be proud of and one of the hardest parts i found of writing my writing journey was really actually getting comfortable with writing things that I didn't think were perfect yet. So I, I struggled a lot with, um, you know, I feel like this line isn't ready to write yet, which is, you know, it's ridiculous, really. If you're a writer and you're experienced, you know that that's not how it works. You write down your ideas and, you know, it comes out however it comes out first and you can edit it into shape. Uh, the idea is to really just get that idea down so you can work around it. And without that, you can't really do much. So that was something I used to really have a lot of problems with. And I had to force myself to write things imperfect that I knew could be the wrong direction for the novel and to not be afraid of that, which really took me, I liked writing in notebooks. And then at some point I would start with a notebook. I still do this. And then I would go to like a word document or Scrivener or something. And what I had to do was start with a notebook and um, purposely write down stuff that I knew wasn't going to work out and write like sideways on the page and draw really terrible pictures and things that I knew that I didn't really want anybody else to see, but it was really loosening myself up to feel comfortable um, writing down things that I didn't think were good enough to be written. And once I did that a whole bunch of times, and it took a while because this was just how I always felt, it took a while of doing that to really start to feel comfortable writing things down um, that were just typical first draft material. So that in itself was a st struggle for me. Oh. No, it, make, it makes sense. Uh, I used I still do know I 
got I had a very unusual sickness about three or four years ago, and I went back to notebooks, and and now I do all my stuff in notebooks again. Uh, my my pen's a unicorn, a, a unicorn pen. It actually writes out of its butt. It's hilarious, and uh, but but uh, I do that because it's, it does a couple things. One, it, I mean, there's just one rule I have with note when I when my notebook, I just don't stop. It doesn't matter if it doesn't work. It's not the point. The point is, you have a story. It needs to get out there. Get it out there. And then you, you can worry about um, all the all the, your mistakes at a later draft. The, the, I think one of the hardest things you have to learn when young is you're never going to have a perfect draft. Ever. Yeah. Ever. And so you have to accept the fact that this is right now the best you can do. And I think the real ch- I think the other thing too is you have a window with every story. I think there's a window of you when you can tell the story and you can tell it as best you can. And then there's a window where the story is not as strongly in you anymore. And something else will say, "Hey, look at me! I can write. You can write me instead. And you're ready for this. Whether you're ready or not doesn't really matter. It just that's how the voices in my head seem to work anyway. And uh, um. So I think I think um, one of the hardest things writers have to come to accept is um, you're not going to be perfect no matter where you are on the journey. Um, you, you're never going to have that, but it's that willingness to progress, that willingness to put to put a pen to paper and to put in the work. Um, if you can do that, you can write anything. That's eventually. Yeah, for sure. Um, my thing is less so um, the idea of having windows when I can write something, which might be true um, to some extent where I might not be as inspired to write something years later, but more so it's that sometimes I'll have um, an idea that I'm really interested in writing and I'll start the, and this, this happened to me. Um, I wrote half of a short story and I really, really wanted to write the rest, but it just wasn't there yet. And so like in your terms, you know, the window just hadn't really opened for me to finish it yet. And I had to wait a year, yeah. actually. And suddenly I said, oh, my God, that would be it. That's the ending. And I had to go back and write that ending. And I submitted it. And it actually did get accepted. But had I tried to force that and just make something up, it simply wouldn't have worked. And, you know, whatever experiences I needed to have to get that ending properly done, uh, just hadn't happened yet, and it just it never would have made it to the point it did. No, that, that that's and that's like equally fair too. I just find like um, your voice changes after after I think a few a few years. It, it it's like um, you had like it's like when you build a foundation. Like you like when you start building something, the first one is it's all right, but then the next book or the next story you write is a better foundation and a better foundation. And if you do that long enough, I find if you go back to your earlier stuff it's almost impossible to fix it because you're not the same person anymore. And that's a good thing. That means you've grown as an artist. But at the same time, you, that, that, that means those stories that, that you felt were were um, fixable or unfixable or whatever the case we were at the time, there might be a point where it's like, I can't pour the concrete on here anymore. I'll make something brand new. Now I'll take that, that same token Sometimes what I'll do is a story like that. I'll take ideas from that story I still like and I'll incorporate them into other things, right? But I, that story for me just tends to that. That's it. It, it. Like if I if I wait too too long, my voice changes, my voice evolves, and I can't I can't uh, fix it anymore. If that makes sense. Yeah, and I actually have two things to say about that, and I hope that I remember both by the time I get to the second. But uh, I had the same experience with my novel that I wrote in high school, which, as I said, was too amateurish to be published anywhere, um, which I knew. But when I came back to it years later with the hope that maybe I could just edit it into something that could be put up, for example, on Wattpad for free, I found myself having a really hard time of, of editing it. I felt like I was editing someone else's work but I do that for a living and so I, I thought like well, what's the problem with editing that then if it, if it seems like someone else's work shouldn't that be my specialty and what it felt like was sort of like I was editing a younger part of myself 
almost like changing my experience. And that felt wrong and I couldn't do it. So I had to leave it. And maybe someday I'll be able to view that very differently. But at this point in my life, it just seems that way. So I really can't. Um, And then the other thing I wanted to say had to do with, I write down ideas, and I learned this the hard way. Um, I used to think of ideas all the time that I thought were okay or I would be intrigued by, but again, I would think, well, where is that going? If it's not going anywhere, why bother writing it down? And I would, of course, later be like, I really wish I had written that down. I could have used that a lot different ways. Um, So now I write down everything and maybe that seems overwhelming to some people, but there's a very big difference between an idea that excites you and an idea that just sort of pops into your head and is like, yeah, okay, well, whatever. Um, And when you get those ideas that excite you, even though you can't see where they're going uh, or they seem like they haven't been flushed out enough, it's really important to write them down. For me, I end up merging a lot of things together that I never thought could have been. I'll take something that I thought was going to be in a fantasy book and put it into my Victorian fiction because actually it's the you know psychological part or maybe it's the atmosphere that I realize, hey, wait a minute, I could really use that here. Yeah, let, let's let's actually merge these things. And I've actually taken three so separate ideas and put them together to create something that I never would have been able to I would have left something unfinished if I hadn't had them written down to sort of flip through and remember later it's 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 like it's like you it's like chemistry this idea combined with this idea and then all of a sudden you just had this explosion in the laboratory going it's alive wait no wait that, that might be just me but that's uh <laughs> but uh no I mean that's the best part like when you when you're creating stuff it's like for me my stuff tends to be a lot more whimsical like you know um, one of my books coming up is Alice in Wonderland, Alice's Pandora. Mm-hmm. Right, it's a great, it's a great, it's a mashup of Greek mythology and Alice in Wonderland. It works surprisingly really well. That's a simpler, that's a simpler, um, in terms of concept, that's a simpler one. Um, what I find the the challenge, and then this is, a, I think, where a book is made or broken, is as a writer, you need to have something to say, like something you feel strongly about saying. If you don't have that, it doesn't matter how cool your concept is. It won't. It won't. It won't have any legs. It's like it's a nice car without a motor. That's pretty much how it's like. It's got no motor. It's got no um, foundation to it. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, and sometimes sometimes you have to write it to find out what your purpose is. Actually, yes, I've had that myself where I write something because I think it's just going to be entertaining. Um, in the end, there was a purpose behind it, and I only realize that once it's done, and I reread it, and I say, yeah, that's what I wanted to do, and I didn't even realize, like, sometimes in different parts of your life, those things come out. You want to do something, maybe in real life, that you can't accomplish because of uh, the type of full-time job you have, or something like that, and then when you write, you accidentally end up accomplishing that in a totally different way, and that's really rewarding. Yes. Well, it, it, like I said, we... we... We we like I said there are things that matter to to I think every everybody there are things that just matter to us and whether we realize it or not writers have this innate ability to to essentially talk to ourselves and create imaginary characters to to tell a story about something that really matters to us and I think uh, the best the best stuff tends to like come from somewhere really important I, I I going back to something I said earlier real reasons why I think the voice changes is because what matters to me right now right which for me at this particular moment is getting out of your comfort zone trying trying new things trying to figure out where i stand in the world well three years from now i might i might know where i stand in the world and then what i might i might i have a completely different uh concern philosophy or or or, or something really that was really meaningful to me compared to now Right, so I feel I feel like uh, that's why that's why uh, that's the challenge. Like that's why I feel like ideas have windows is because what those things that really really matter to you, um, they evolve because you evolve. Yeah, I I agree with that. Th- different things matter as your life changes and. Some things that maybe you need to express because you can't or because you just have no one else to express them to or you want to spread a message. The topic of those changes all the time. And so our goals overall can certainly change. Why we're writing can change. 
really everything can change, including the literal writing voice, which can sometimes, you know, one of the things that I worked on for a long time was I used to write in a way um, for nonfiction. So maybe blog posts and things like that. That was very much more stiff. I had a lot of academic training and had really lost the ability to write uh, in a more casual and accessible way. And so I didn't like how that was coming out, but what's the only way to fix it? To try Mm -hmm. and to read other people working into practice. And so I would go around and read blogs that I didn't particularly care for, but I just really wanted to read their style because the style was very good. And of course, what you're looking to do is not necessarily copy it. You're looking to see what is it that I like about this um, right now and, and what makes it readable in my own opinion? What do I think between my opinion and the reader is similar? You know, what are we both liking and maybe what I don't like, you know, is more the topic than the actual writing style. And then, you know, as I evolved on my blog, I found that I could finally start writing more casually. Sometimes that more um, stiff academic side still finds its way. It's a tough one to shake totally, but uh, it's definitely improved by doing it and because um, like for example once I started like a Patreon um, you know I don't want to have that kind of stiff style I want people to feel like they're talking one on one with me and like we're friends you know so I had to really get past that and um, one of the ways that that happened was by quitting my full time job and I feel that I really never would have been able to totally put that stiff style behind me if uh, I had still been in that that world where um, sometimes there are things that you're experiencing in real life that keep you from moving forward in other areas. And I don't mean for that to sound negative. No, there it's, definitely, it, yeah, there are definitely ways that you can break past things. But in some ways, things can sort of encapsulate you and force you well, to stay where you are. And um, once I quit my full-time job, I can't tell you how many things I suddenly understood that I simply couldn't grasp before. Well, no, it, it well, it's just again, it, it's the whole concept of change. Like I have a I have a day job, which I I uh, on my Facebook I, I refer to it as a sparkle muffin because at the best of day at the best of days it's seems like a drunken hot mess. Now I'm only there part time now, which is uh, now which was necessary for me. So again, it, it, you're you're I have to make for what I want to do. I have to make changes. Unfortunately, I need money. That's why I'm still there, but mm-hmm. which which uh, which area I think is a, a problem a lot of artists have. It's like you need money, so ergo get a job. But on the flip side, right? I don't have to be there full time. I don't have to expose myself to whatever chicanery or 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 whatever I feel is is intervening with what I can do. I don't have to be there for anymore, right? And I can still show up and do what I have to do, and and it, but it's quicker. I'm there less. I can do more on my own, which and I can challenge myself in ways I couldn't because I have more time. Eventually, I have to get rid of. The, I do know there's going to come a point where the job's going to get in the way completely, and then I'm going to have to walk away completely. Hopefully, by then, you know, I'll I'll have this 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 writing podcasting thing figured out. And, and I won't need to be there as much. And as a result, I can just keep dwindling away until it comes to nothing. But, I mean, time will tell. But that, I think uh, it's also about comfort zone. Like, you, if you're in a zone for so long, and you're being, it's just, you're, you're stuck, right? And you don't want to, and, and that's the worst thing. Because then you're progressing your, your ability to change, to grow, to evolve. And we all need to keep doing that, no matter how old we are, because... Um, life is change, and if you can't, and if you're in a position now where you get comfortable or or you've stopped evolving, you can't move forward, and that will. I mean, you you'd still be able to accomplish a lot, but you won't be able to accomplish everything that you set out to do. Does that make sense? Right, I agree. Yes, and uh, I think there's a really big when we say comfort zone. Sometimes it can sound a bit like you're actually happy or comfortable with where you are in the way of I enjoy this or I really get it or something like that. And sometimes comfort zone is not, you know, like you're saying, it can be not such a good thing. Um, And it's not just in the way of I'm not having new experiences. It can be in the way of I feel very restless. And even though this is my comfort zone, I'm sick of it. I'm done with it. You know, that kind there are so many 
there are so many things that you can feel in relation to a comfort zone. And I feel um, like it's unfortunate that we can't express all of them in such a short time because I feel that when people hear the term comfort zone, they think it's not such a bad thing in some ways. Uh, but in other ways, like I feel like there's a standard definition that doesn't quite actually can, suit in every way. Can I can I try to elaborate for you? Because I think I, I think I can help you with this a little bit. It's not about being comfortable. Not in the sense that people understand comfort. Like, look, I'm not saying don't have food in your belly. Don't be surrounded by people you love. Don't be... Don't be... You want to be in a positive environment. That's one thing. But there's also a point where you're not growing in your environment anymore. There's a certain point where um, the two biggest bro- built uh, roadblocks for most people to grow and evolve and change are fear. And that means letting it rule you. Not that you're afraid, but you, that the fear is dictating your actions. But this is where the comfort zone comes into play. The word is familiarity. The problem the problem with comfort zones is, that, okay, maybe you're not in a position you want to be in for whatever that whatever that is. The fact of the matter is, though, you know this space you're in and you're not moving past the space you're in. And... Because you know this space, and it's kind of, for lack of a better term, safe. Now, if you to grow and evolve and change, you have to leave that space behind, and you have to go out and venture out and go forth, and and, and leave that, and, and be willing to let that go in order to become whatever it is you seek to become, right? And that and that's how it works. Like you can't completely, you can't completely, uh, um. You can't move forward without giving up completely what's behind you. And comfort zone, sometimes the comfort we're talking about is that familiarity, that, that, that space you have that you carry with you that doesn't necessarily make you happy or doesn't necessarily, um, you know, you're not necessarily in a fulfilling space, but rather a familiar one. Does that yeah, make sense? That's, that's definitely it. And, uh, you know, that, that can happen in – it's shocking um, when you do – and probably you've already had this experience when you went part-time with your job. But when you quit your job, when you make a major change, something like that, it's reality of what you're doing. Um, so what I mean by that is you can have a plan. You know, and it can be a very well thought out plan that you've taken lots of time on and you've looked at, you know, the true reality of your finances, what your days will really be structured like and things like that. And yet, when suddenly you don't have to drive to your job and you think that that's going to be, you know, such a great thing, um, in, in a lot of ways, like there's there's that part of you that says, oh, I'm so glad I don't have to wake up so early and like force myself out of bed if I stay up late to like finish work or something. And uh, I don't have to get all, you know, um, done up, especially as a woman and, you know, go in and do this long drive and then, you know, see, you know, the same people every day or whatever it may be for you. And at the same time, it's kind of a strange double edged sword, like what we're what we're saying, where all of a sudden you find yourself on your own. And you're sort of like, I'm really used to going in and having coffee with the same people at the same time and doing, like you said, a familiar task every single time. And it can be sort of like your brain has trouble adapting, even though you planned this and you knew you were going to do it and you knew what it was going to be like. Mm -hmm. Your brain has a hard time sometimes really getting it. And so there is, and I don't don't know the statistic or anything like that, but there are people who... Um, actually talk about this in a realistic way um, whereas you know it's good to hear the positive side sometimes we need to know what the truth is and that we are going to come out of a job and feel really high for a little bit and then really low for a little bit and then it's going to even out and you're going to be where you want to be but it's it's quite a journey emotionally um, when you do come out of that familiarity and that comfort zone well we're, I'm, not, I'm telling where well for me it's almost like I'm still warring the big challenge the big challenge is keeping your discipline up yeah that that's that's the real challenge because one thing thing about a day job that it, that a lot of people take for granted is it, it does force a certain degree of discipline you wake up you have to be at this place at this time so you have to be ready at this place in this time and you have to do these things at this place in this time that is not those are not bad habits to have what you're doing them for you might have outgrown but those habits are um, important, not just for your work, but for your life. Yes. And, and, and so, 
I have a, I do believe that to some degree that this is very true and that your work is your worship. I'm not talking like your job is what you believe in or you worship, but how you go about doing things says an awful lot about who you are as a person. And so the big, the, so the high, uh, okay, like right now, right now there are people I know working and I'm not there. And I feel great about that. I really, really do, <laughs> right? Yeah. But same token. Okay. So write this now, partly because we are currently in Siberia and Alberta right now. And that's, that, that's part of the reason why this is the case. But one of the things I'm forcing myself to do is I am forcing myself to not get into a position normally of, you know, sleeping in too much later. That I'm doing, accomplishing something today, right? And I have, like, like right now, I mean, I have challenges. Like, I ha and I have, in some ways, new limitations for myself. And some of this stuff's good, but it's an adjustment. And I'm kind of still getting that adjustment days, if that makes sense. Um, I'm about to launch my Patreon. I'm about to publish, uh, get my uh, an ebook out there shortly thereafter. Um, I'm, but I'm, mo I'm moving forward. But I find like I'm. It's really easy to get complacent, even if you're out of the job. And the reason I think a lot of people end up going back to work full time. I've done this myself. Is you get you get you you get yourself in a position where you let the your freedoms. Um, get in the way of your discipline. And that's a really tough balance as an artist because most time artists are like, hey, I can create, I can be free, and blah, 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 blah. No, there's a discipline to what we do. Sometimes the things that we have in our lives are there to teach us those disciplines. And now that we're on our own, can we actually follow through with them now that we are on our own? Does that make sense? Yes, and I think that one of the things that hurts that for some people is I've noticed that there are so many ads for these, you know, life coaches and creative people who say, you know, um, look, you know, do you, do you want to spend almost all your time with your family? Do you want to work like three hours a week? <laughs> yeah, that, 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 <laughs> yeah, that's a joke. That's and a you see that and you're just like, who are you talking about? <laughs> what, what are you saying? <laughs> It's not the truth of entrepreneurship. And if you're super lucky, maybe you have some passive income that allows you to do that kind of a thing where you spend minimal time per week or something like that. But, um, you know, an entrepreneur's life is 24-7 work. I mean, you are working from the moment you get up to many times the moment you go to sleep. And it's because you love it that it doesn't – it's not the same kind of stress as a job that you dislike or that you just don't feel any passion for. That causes a lot of stress emotionally and in many other ways um, but you know it really oh, it hurts me so much every time I see those ads and I think of all the people who think that this well, is real and I see the comments you know where they say oh I'd, I'd love to do that I really want more time for my family and I'm sort of like look you know thinking you're getting pulled into you, marketing that you, you, you want you to you're getting sucked that, into the program go away go away don't look at the flame yeah. it's a lie but it's so it's pretty. <laughs> it's, a lie. Yeah. it's not true. <laughs> yeah. It's I know the flame looks pretty, but don't look at it. And then you just see these guys going like lost the flame. So pretty. Just, ah! Every time. Right? It's like, what do you mean you gotta do this? Because that's how it starts. Like I, well, like the goal I like this is the thing, right? I have in my podcast, as of this recording, two hundred and thirty plus episodes. And I, I don't see myself stopping anytime soon. <laughs> And the thing about that is what's going to eventually, and this is what's been happening bit by bit by bit, every episode I built, I have done has built momentum for me. And so what, what, what I found is I used to have certain numbers. And I mean, don't get me wrong, I still have weeks where those numbers are, are the same. But I have a lot more weeks now where my numbers are higher, are a lot higher. And that's, and because my show is growing, my, my reach is growing. And... This year, I, I have certain goal like like goals that way, and, and and what I'm doing now is my backlog is now building my front log, and my front log is referring people to my back list, if that makes sense. And it's same with writing. As I release more books, people are going to be aware of my previous books, and and that is eventually where the passive income comes in. But it doesn't happen overnight. Like whether you're a writer, whether you're like me, like you're podcasting, like you, you do, you do your own shows and stuff like that too. It, 
it, this stuff doesn't happen in over overnight very rare or very rarely does it that is that the case it takes years and years of work to get to the point where it's like hey my wheel is going by itself now this is so cool and then you can do the frankenstein it's alive thing and it's actually to some degree true you've created a machine that's actually now doing the lifting but it doesn't just happen by itself it happens because you have sat there and you've showed up and you've done what you've set out to do and and you haven't quit and the the result has kind of of uh, happened and then hopefully you're smart enough to get out of your own damn way when it happens and that that's it but it, that it's simple but it's certainly not easy not by any means, and it's certainly not what they advertise about, uh, you know, start charging $600 an hour right off the bat. <laughs> yeah, that's it. come to you. Hey, hey, they'll oh, come. Okay. That's, it's working for me because you're looking at my flame. Just look at the flame. <laughs> Give me the money. Right? It doesn't work like that, unfortunately. But, I mean, do I see a point in time for me where I'm going to get to the point where I think I'm going to get a degree of momentum and enough stuff happening where... I might not be making, like, a zillion dollars. I hope I'm making a zillion dollars. But, I mean, uh, realistically speaking, I'm, I'm looking at the fact that I've, I've just, I've created something, and that something is, is generating something. I can see that day coming. And as a result, I'm looking at it kind yeah. of like, 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 that's what I'm building towards. And then eventually, as I keep doing it, more and more stuff will come. That's how, and, and more outdoors will open. I have a pretty award to my to my right as a result of me doing this. So I mean, I've certainly gotten some recognition doing this. So it, it's it's definitely I, I'm building, and I I can see the growth and the building and all that stuff now. Um, but again, it, it it's not, this took. I've been doing the podcast for three years. I've been interviewing people for fifteen years. I mean, I, 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 that's my overnight success story. Fifteen years, people. Woo! Right. <laughs> You have to develop that talent. You have to develop that skill. And it's not something, like you said, it doesn't happen overnight. But um, it's something that whatever you choose to do, you know, for your life or whatever you're trying to pursue takes a lot of work. And if you're there, there are very rarely those overnight successes. But many times we look at those overnight successes and we find out that actually they've been taking writing classes for years. Or actually, they had a mentor who was super famous, you know, and um, there's a lot of things that contribute that we don't we don't see very often. And so the point of saying that is really a, a positive one, that everyone works hard toward their goals. No one just jumps on a train and suddenly is at their destination. So it's really important to be patient and just, you know, work towards what you're doing and enjoy every moment. Don't be looking so far ahead that you can't enjoy what you're doing and all that you're learning and how your path may even, you know, separate off in some other directions that maybe, like you said, you need to get out of your way and and be able to take those on if there's something that interests you. Would, would you like to hear my five rules? I would. Show up, rule one. Two, do your shit. Three, don't quit. Four, the rest is rain. And five, get out of your fucking way. That's it. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, you can't really put it any more succinctly than that, Josh. Yes. <laughs> I think it's perfect. <laughs> well, no, it, it's... I I, uh, I I learned an awful lot about people this year, the last couple of years, and one of the things I, I recognized with most people, they don't show up. It, it Honestly, that... If I were if I were to tell why people don't succeed, it's rules one and rule five. Rule five is a more recent one. Rule, rule, uh, rule one, uh, it, most, a lot of people just don't show up. They, they 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 will talk a game, but when push comes to shove, they won't do it. And I don't know what it is, that mechanism that's missing in a lot of people, but they just don't have it. And when you see that they don't have it, um, I mean, they've already won. They've already decided their fate. Now, rule three is the one that's, really, that's probably the most important one of the bunch. Don't quit, because you don't quit, you're going to get something for it. You know what you're going to get, who knows, that's rule four. I have no idea. I can't. The paradox of success is, um, you, you can do everything right and still not succeed. That's the paradox. Um, the flip side is you you will fail if you do nothing for sure. And all you can really do is put yourself in positions to succeed, which is where rule five is kind of really important. Get out of your own way. Some sometimes good things. I had a friend. Uh, she uh, was really upset and flustered 
Uh, she's a massage therapist. And uh, she was getting all this work in Airdrie, but she was upset that her life was like not going the way she wanted to do it in Calgary and all that stuff. I listened to her for about five minutes, and I recognized, like, so let me see if I get this right. You have a full-time job awaiting you in another city, and you can just take it in, like, a couple months, and your problems are solved. So why are you complaining? And she stopped, thought about that for a sec. She's like, you're absolutely right. Right? I'm like, yeah. Because, again, people people get in their own way sometimes. And, and you have to recognize that, no, you actually have your opportunity. It's right in front of you. I, I try. I mean, I'm, I, I know I fucked this up more and more on one occasion. I think we all do. It's like, that opportunity is right there. All you have to do is take it. Take it. And, but sometimes you just don't see it. And I think that, that that's a that comes with practice and a, and a, and a few of a few episodes of banging your head to the desk after you realize what you've screwed up. But you know, we 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 all have that. I think so. Uh, it I find these work. I, and I've learned it, and I and I just apply it, and I and I can look at someone, and if they apply these, if they I can tell if they're if they're applying these rules specifically one and three, they'll be good. It's true. It's a it's a formula, but it's it's got a lot of um, depth to it. Once you really look at it, you know it's it's um, something that sounds simple, and the concepts are simple, but the actual doing requires a lot of work. Absolutely, and that's the great thing. I mean, it's a great thing, and people hear a lot of work and they get turned off. Well, but, uh, <laughs> well, well, how well, else are you gonna do it? <laughs> but well, well, they, well, I think a lot of people confuse simple and easy. Mm-hmm. Right, they confuse them. They're not the same thing. The easiest thing in the world is to do nothing, like absolutely nothing. That's the easiest thing we can all do. I can get it. I don't have to get out of bed. That that was incredibly easy. But you know, I'll pay for that. You know, if I if uh, sooner or later, you know, if I if I stay in bed long enough, I'm gonna get a knock on the door and they'll be like, "Hey, listen, their rent's due," and I can be like, "I can still stay in bed, but eventually, you know, uh, someone will force the door open and." They, they might have to struggle to get me out of that bed, but I'm not going to be there forever and ever. I mean, they're, doing nothing's easy, but there are consequences of being easy. Simple goes, well, you got a simple plan. Congratulations. Here's the road, and you'll notice it, it, on your road map that there's a lot of circles and curves and ups and downs. You're looking at this and going, this seems incredibly convoluted. Why am I doing this? But that's that's the way it works. Like, if you're choosing to do anything, you got it's a everything you do is a journey. So, but it's the only way you're gonna you're gonna grow. It's the only way you're gonna figure out who you are. It's the only way you're going to um, build yourself. Self esteem doesn't come from um, self esteem comes from accomplishment. That's the biggest build one of the biggest building blocks of self esteem. But that the the only way to get it is you have to get you have to be willing to go out there and get your ass kicked. That's just that's just the way it is. Yes, not everything can go smoothly. Not everything's going to be perfect, but that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. We're we're not made to be perfect. We're made to experience things, and what we're supposed to be doing is taking all of those things in and understanding why things happen and how we could do better this time, better next time. Um, you know, whether we even should have tried whatever we were doing and why or why not. There's just so much that you can think about when you finally do do whatever you're looking to do. So, like, you know, your your first rule, if someone publishes a book, well, we all know that that's not just writing. You know, you're not just writing something. It's an entire process um, with editing and book covers and consistency and practice and then marketing, and then making sure that you're going to write a lot more books. You know, yes. you can't just take one step, drop it, and hope for the best, as we all know. Well, as we hopefully all know. <laughs> Again, the light, the light, the light. Yeah. Look at the light. Look into <laughs> the light. It will draw you in, right? But um, that's it. It's that's it. Like I, I, I figured this out for the last two years, um, and. Again, I have learned that this this has been a magical evolving process. It has changed. I'm, by the way, folks, I'm not selling this as a as a, a concept to join or a cult. I'm not interested in any of that. The only cult I'm into is is the one I'm having with a friend of mine involving cookies. That's a completely different topic altogether. the 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 thing is, I learned that if because I focus, you you tend to be focused on 
the things that, that matter to you. This matters to me. So what I have found is when I made this decision, certain people magically disappeared from my life as a result. Other people have come into my life as a result too. Does that make sense? It does. It, it, it absolutely does. Um, when you change what you're doing, who you are, your goals, things like that, it affects the world around you always. And um, I can say that I've seen the exact time exact same type of thing happen and the more changes you make the more you see that changing around you especially if you allow it if you're fighting it all the way it could be a different story but if you're allowing it as you say get out of your own way you would be amazed how much your life can can change by uh following that path seeing those opportunities not blinding yourself not getting in your own way you know um there's there's just so much and one of the things that I keep wanting to shout from the rooftops is just keep working toward your goal. And even if, you know, you feel miserable at the time because you're working a job you don't like and you're working too many hours um, on something you don't like and you're working hard in another, you know, the, the path that you want and all that kind of stuff, it will add up and it doesn't always right away. And you can make yourself a lot more miserable um, just by sort of resisting the fact that you're growing and your time hasn't come yet. And that's something I did to myself many times where I was just like, I just can't take this anymore. <laughs> I really hate what I'm doing. I just can't do it. I'm trying to convince myself. But maybe if I had just opened my eyes a little bit um, to see the path that I was on, like once in a while I would be able to do that and say, okay, well, it's not time for my editing business to take me away from my full-time job yet. There's a lot that I'm learning here. Sometimes my eyes would open to that, and sometimes I would just be totally miserable and be like what's going what's going on what's happening why why are things the way they are um and of course that affects my mood and it affects who's around me and um the same thing when you do get out of your way and you do finally finally you can get where you're going and your whole um attitude and the way just everything changes based on you and so your entire environment actually does change while that sounds very mystical and magical it's not it just is what you're putting out there absolutely no i um for for me it, it like one of the things like at this moment as i literally can in my case personally i feel like this is a transition point because i'm like again that friend is leaving my sister's leaving town a lot of my close friends aren't around me right now and it's an interesting thing because of what's happening now is, again, I can kind of sense that there's a transition going on, right? But I'm not sure where it's going yet, if that makes sense. It's like, well, so I, I'm doing the only smart thing I possibly can do, and that's just I'm keeping my doors open. It's like, you know what? The door is open. What can come in will come in, you know? Maybe, maybe I will regret this at some point. Maybe I won't. But, I mean, it's just at this point in time, it's just one of those It's like, okay, things are changing. Things are moving. Things are evolving. Um, I can't, I, I shouldn't, uh, I should not try, I should try to be grateful the whole way through it, regardless of where it leads me. Does that make sense? Being grateful is one of the most important things you can do uh, um, because it does clear a lot of, uh, negative feelings that you can have, um, realizing just how much you have does impact how you see what's around you. Um, and that's also part of your environment changing. Sometimes the environment change is in your brain a little bit, because if you can be grateful for the things that you actually dislike, you can change sometimes the way you view them and realize that while I don't like this, it's, it's giving me um, you know, these skills or it's giving me these experiences, which is actually growing me as a person quickly, even though it's painful in some cases. Uh, so, you know, I, there are so many things like that that I wish I could tell my younger self, even like a two year ago self, I would love to tell. Yeah, 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 yeah <laughs> but, but it's like, okay, there's also that part. Okay. This is, this is the rule five thing. Sometimes we do, we do get in our own way and, and what happens is we run into this like concrete wall. And for whatever the reason is, we have to we, it, we lead into it with our face. I'm not sure why that is the way it is, but that is how life works. This is the way you got to go. And, they, and there's this big giant wall. No, I'm going to go through the wall. And life's going to be like, well, shrug. Okay. And, you just, and it's like those cartoons. You'll see, you, you'll see you smash the head. You'll see the, you might see a little crack here and there in the wall because, you know, we're very impressed of how hard we can hit that wall sometimes. But inevitably, we're going to give before the wall does. Right. Or actually, 
That's not always true. Sometimes, and this is the only the ultimate caution I give people, at the end of the day, we do exactly what we want to do. And it doesn't matter who you are. You do. Like, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. The, the concern people need to realize is if you don't have a clear direction of what you want and where you're going and who you are, you're still going to do what you want. And that's scary. Because if you don't really put thought into it, well, you might end up where you really didn't want to go. Yet you did. Does that make sense? That's where listening very closely to what's really in front of you is important and trying not to tint it by the lens of what you hope for or um, what you think life should be because a lot of times the reality is so very different. That's not a bad thing, but we see it as a bad thing. It is like if I don't get where you know my current goal is, then that's negative and um, I'm not doing a good enough job. Sometimes it's not really our fault. As you say, we can... We can head into that wall face first, and we can keep doing that if we want to. Um, you know, that's the the both glory and unfortunate part of, you know, free choice. But um, if you're paying attention and you're pushing in the wrong direction hard, you'll, you'll kind of know. You'll start to get it. You'll start to really feel that. And it's frustrating because sometimes you just don't see it. You just don't see where you're supposed to be headed. Now, if you really listen to yourself inside, one of the things that I love that um, motivates speaker Mel Rock is like that you know what you were saying before is fears are really our greatest obstacle and there are so many things we're afraid of that we don't realize we're afraid of sometimes um, one of the things she actually talked about this morning when we're talking Josh is um, she was saying that a lot of people are afraid to speak their dreams out loud to share their true goals and most of the time this is because they're afraid of being laughed at they're afraid of being told it's impossible we all have dreams that are very very high and there's nothing wrong with that you should always have dreams that are really really big dreams that's great it's the stepping stones along the way and you know when we can admit to ourselves what we truly want what what we are afraid of saying to someone else because they might laugh at us that you want to be you know jk rowling that's who you want to be there's no need, you know, to necessarily say that to another person who you know is just going to be like, yeah, okay, everyone wants to do that, lol, you know, you don't have to say that, you, but you should write it down in your notebook, and you should write down what you think you need to do, and you should write down what you think is standing in your way so you can start taking those blocks away. And, like, those are the types of things that can that can help you stop crashing into walls because you're headed in the wrong direction. Stop you um, thinking something is your goal that really you're just putting out there because it's what's socially acceptable and getting into the depth of what is really going to take for you to actually achieve that goal. And then as we keep saying, getting out of your own way to see where your destiny is really going to lie. You really like that one. I really like that one. It's so important. It's really important. It's well, one of those things that like is a life changing thing if you can. If you can see just it, like, do it. Uh, it'll, we'll see. Last year I won the Aurora, and I realized like, and here, here's the thing about that was I didn't nominate myself and I didn't vote for myself. I I, I just won. I, it just happened. It was one of those things that was like I was meant to win the award apparently because I people believed in me enough that put my name to a hat, then just even being a finalist was awesome. But I actually won. And it was like, how did I do that? Except I, I, I was smart enough just to do my thing and just let people make their own decisions. That's it. I didn't, I, and that, that's all it took. And I'm like, so if I get out of my way, stuff like this can happen. And, it's like it clicks it's like hey i get this now right that's but, the whole thing and if you had been afraid of saying i'd love to have a podcast because and i i'd love to reach people and you know whatever your goal may have been none of this would be I, 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 actually I, I gotta let you in on the secret so you know how why i started a podcast i'll tell you the, mm -hmm. the exact reason i started a podcast was because robert sawyer said podcast when i interviewed him i used to do you go on my blog you'll far enough back in my blog you will see me doing written interviews with um, with some really cool people. And the thing is, I've always loved Rolling Stone as a as a just as an interview template. I really like love how they do interviews, and I wanted to do something like that on my blog. And I so I finally get a phone, like a smartphone. I'm like, yes, I have finally crossed the 21st century barrier. 
and I interview Rob. And Rob mentions podcasts. So I have what I call I call a Peter Parker voice in my head. And the reason I say it's a Peter Parker voice is because when Spider-Man fights crime, he's always cracking jokes. And the reason he's always cracking jokes is he's scared. But this is how he manages his fear. So I'm like, so I have a voice like that in my head. It's like, podcast? I didn't think about a podcast. I Wait, could I do a podcast? Yes, I could do a podcast. I think I could do a podcast. I don't know what I'm doing. You never let that stop you. And, um... You, you just and that that's it like I it just was one of those doors where it was like this door is here if you want it I just walked in that's all I did and that's all I do like I I, I I again I try to simplify things because I find that if you simplify things it's not un, it's no longer unattainable it doesn't matter what the goal is if you can find a way to simplify what you're doing right you can at that point, even though it might be a big, giant road, it doesn't matter. You're, you're simplifying it. It's not a million tasks. It's just one, right? Now, there might be a million parts to that task, but it doesn't matter anymore. Now, it's just the rest is just problem solving. Does that work? That's exactly what I was saying before. Yeah, write down those things that will take yeah. you where you're going. Yeah, exactly. Just break it down. It, yeah. it seems like some good thing, but nothing actually yeah. is once you break it down. Yeah, no, absolutely no, and and I think uh, the last the last word you got the last thing, and this is something I learned in high school that I I, I beat out of myself. Um, the word realistic, there is no real, at, at, least, at least not in the way people think it's real. Realistic doesn't doesn't mean what people think it means. So if someone goes, your goal is not realistic, how the hell do they know that? They really don't. Of course, they don't. Yeah. Yeah, they really don't. I had a teach. I had teachers. I had teachers that would in high school go. You need to have realistic goals. You know, I, I and and I can look at like my own life specifically, and I can go. You know, I have my life is nothing that resembles normal, but I'm okay with that. I didn't want a normal life. I wanted to do my own thing, and and by and large, I have. Cool. Yeah, if you can if you can break out of those constraints of quote normal, <laughs> then you're going to be a lot better off, but, and uh, it'll be way easier to see your way forward. Yes. So, so I think I think Miss Christie, we 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 could probably. I I think I, I I do think this that I I thoroughly enjoy chatting with you. I do think though that we've had hit the magical interview point where I tend to like to leave interviews off. So, what's going on with you, and how can people find you? This will air by the way in like March. Wow, this has been really great. Yeah. I, what, what did you say? This this will this will this will air like around end of March. So if there's anything like big time coming up around that point in time, like just say so, and we will and I will pimp to the moon or something to that effect. Anyway, <laughs> I don't have anything special coming up at that time that I know of, but I will be. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for having me on. I. I We've been on at least one, I believe it was one show before, and yes. we, right before that show, we're having a great time, having a great conversation, and this is the same, so I've, I've really enjoyed it, I really had a good time. Yes. Um, as you said, I think we could talk for a long time, so um, I really appreciate that, and you can find me at christystratus.com, I am also on on patreon.com slash Christy Stratus and the levels start as low as a dollar a month and you can find me on Instagram Facebook Twitter Pinterest um, the Creative Edge Writers Showcase is twice a month you can find that on SoundCloud iTunes it, pretty much just look for it you can pretty much find it anywhere you want to I am the author of two books Anatomy of a Darkened Heart and Brotherhood of Secrets they are both psychological suspense taking place in the Victorian era and um, in March if you happen to be in the New Jersey area or traveling to the New Jersey area I will be at the New Jersey I will be at the Liberty States Fiction Writers Conference and I will be taking your pitches if you sign up um, I am an acquiring editor for City Owl Press so if you happen to be there to me i would love to meet you and uh, otherwise you know I'm, i would love to come back and thank you so much for having me josh and i definitely hope i will have christy back sometime so check out creative judge writers showcased uh like i said christy was a hoot i really really was i'm gonna try to wrap this up super quick uh so thanks for listening for this episode so if you want to support this podcast you can do so in a number of different ways you can subscribe to the podcast i am on itunes google play spotify potomac just come on in say hi uh review it 
Tell me if you like the episode, hate the episode, that'd be great. The Watcher, Storm Dancer, Wandering God are my books courtesy of Mirror World Publishing. You can go on their website, mirrorworldpublishing.ca, or you can uh, you can find my books through Amazon, Kobo, wherever books are sold. Words and Princesses provide me with a book for the weeks. It is Suiciders. I've mentioned this on Monday. Feel free to add your email to the mailing list. I will draw out for Monday's episode. So you got until Sunday night to do so. Outside of that, my YouTube channel is Joshua Pentelaresco. And that is everything. Thanks very much for listening, guys. I'll talk to you guys next time. Josh. Josh.